Again, my name is Scotty and I'm the peer advocate here for OSU Internal Medicine Specialty. Um, next slide. Um, next slide. Sorry, okay. Um, so my role as a peer advocate here in the clinic is I have several roles that I do. Um, one of the main ones is helping youth age um, HIV patients that are transitioning from their pediatric infectious disease doctor to our clinic. Um, so my role would be I would meet them with their doctor over there and introduce myself and explain to them the transition process. And then when they transition over here, if they need me to go to the first appointment with them, just so that way they can feel more comfortable and at ease having someone in there, then I will do that with them. Um, just kind of sit back and let the doctor talk to them and just kind of be there with them without trying to talk too much. Um, unless they request, I ask questions and stuff like that to help them get comfortable with the situation. Um, and then some of the other ones is I reach out to all of our patients who have become non-compliant, who have quit showing up to appointments, have so many no-call, no-shows. And then I reach out to them and see how I can help them to get back into the clinic, get back in, seeing the doctor, get back on the medications, and come up with a game plan on keeping them coming. Um, and then same with all of our newly diagnosed patients, um, whether it's through the test and treat or just a newly diagnosed patient coming to the clinic for the first time. I will follow those patients anywhere from six months to a year on a spreadsheet that I keep on my computer, um, calling them every so often, just asking them how they're doing, anything I can help with. Um, finding support groups in the area, um, whether it's for HIV support or if they need more help, whether it's um, getting in touch with our psychiatrist or one of our therapists, um, help with substance abuse, which is what one of the barriers to care is, um, helping them in that aspect and just really trying to keep them in care as much as possible. And so that's why I follow them. Some of them I may only follow for six months, some of them up to a year, if not longer. Um, and then, sorry. Um, so along with many other things, um, I call patients on Thursdays and Fridays, the ones that have missed labs for the week, um, mainly just because they forgot, they didn't realize it was time. So I call Thursdays and Fridays, I call all patients that missed labs to get them back in here so we don't have to reschedule the doctor's appointments and risk them not coming in, you know. So I really try to keep up on all our patients, whether they're um, really needed or not, you know, just as a friendly reminder, hey, your labs, or hey, your doctor's appointment's coming up. Um, and then my other big case right now is with COVID, um, that's been pretty scary for a lot of our patients. And so we got a grant um, giving out masks to all of our patients. So I have a call every patient in our clinic and sent masks in the mail, um, ones that were made out of fabric that they can wash and reuse to make them feel more comfortable whether getting out of the house, coming up here to do labs, and then being able to do a virtual appointment at home. Um, next slide. And so, um, and then my other thing too is making sure that all of our patients have the tools that they need. Um, whether it's 
a lot of patients have been coming in here lately to do virtual because they don't have the means to do it at home, whether they don't have a computer or a phone. Um, so we have a virtual room set up here at the clinic. That's where I'm at right now. Um, and we have it logged in through a special patient portal so they can come in and use the computer. It's very safe. And I set all that up for them and then leave them alone while they do their appointments. And they can see our psychiatrist that way. They can see the doctors that way too if they prefer to have a virtual instead of an in-person appointment. Um, next slide. So our first barrier to care is substance abuse. Um, and sadly, you know, we do see it a lot. Um, this patient is a 64-year-old Caucasian male. He does live in rural Oklahoma. Um, and he suffers from alcoholism. Um, a lot this year, I know it's been tricky too. He is, um, he does not come into the clinic for appointments. He does all his um, virtually. And so, but he has lapsed so much in the past to where he would call up and complain about not being able to have medication or being out of medication. And so at this point, we have gotten him back into care. He is, has all his refills. Um, he's back on medication. Um, sadly, he's alone. So there's not a lot of accountability on his end. Uh, I have had several phone calls with him over the phone um, trying to see, I've asked him many times, how can I help you? How can we make sure you get to your appointments? Um, and we have, luckily, we have many means that can help out now, um, whether it's a ride share assistance or whatever. Um, the last appointment, he was able to find transportation to get there. So um, I've been trying to call him once a week, I usually get to talk to him about once every two weeks. He will answer the phone for me or call me back. But um, I'm really trying to keep that line of communication with him so that way he doesn't get to the point to where he's like, hey, I'm out of medications, I'm out of refills, and then starts blaming us for not having medication. Um, again, it's because he has chosen alcohol as his um, way to deal with so much of life that that takes first priority sometimes. And so that's the one conversation we had last is how can we, how is that not his number one priority? You know, how his health needs to be a bigger priority. And he does see that, he knows that. It's just trying to get him to start implementing that. And that's what we're working on now. So hopefully good things will come of this. Um, and that's communication. I stay in as much communication as I can with him, leave messages and cross my fingers that he will call me back. Um, next slide. And Scotty, you'll also give them information on support groups as well, right? And then we have a therapist that's here in the clinic. We have two therapists, actually, um, and they can provide that stuff. And of course, we have um, a psychiatrist as well. Uh, but sometimes, um, Scotty, you might be the point of contact. And so, um, especially after you build that rapport with them, um, you're able to share some of that um, information with them as well, right? Absolutely. And that, and that is something that him and I have talked about. Um, he's not 100% ready for that. Um, but I have looked up um, programs in his vicinity, like close enough to him. And so um, when he's ready, I'm ready to give him that information. Um, our next barrier to care, of course, is COVID-19. Um, it has made this year very interesting. Um, 
I started this position at the very beginning of all this, like right when it was starting is when I got the job. Um, I've been lucky enough to, I've been here in clinic the entire time and staying very healthy. Um, this is a 50, a 52 year old woman, Caucasian uh, female. Um, and she lives about an hour outside of town. So she does commute into the clinic to do blood work. Um, she has lapsed in care this year um, just for the anxiety of it all. Um, she has not left her house really at all. Um, she sends her husband to the grocery store to do the grocery pickup. Um, if she does get out of the house, it's, she goes for a drive. Um, she gets in the passenger seat and they drive around town, drive out to the country and back um, while she never gets out of the car. She has attempted to come to the clinic five times. Um, she gets as far as the parking lot and then she breaks down starts hyperventilating, crying, um, and she cannot get herself to get out of the car to come in. And so the patient was passed to me and I got a hold of her. Um, it took me three times to finally get her to the clinic. Um, what we had to do was I was able to get her to the clinic and to minimize her exposure, like being in the building um, I printed off, I had her labs printed off, and then I met her upstairs in the lab. I dropped off her labs, um, called her while she was in the parking lot, and was like, okay, your labs are upstairs. So all she had to do was walk into the building, get her temperature check, and she was able to head right up to the fifth floor. Um, I made arrangements with our clinic just in case if any patients did show up needing to do blood work to hold them off for a minute. So um, our lab facility upstairs was completely empty. It was just the tech up there that was going to be doing the blood draw for her. So we got her into the clinic. She was able to walk right in, do her labs, and walk right back out. She never once came into contact with anybody else besides the person at the front door doing the temperature checks and the lab technician. Um, and then she was able to do all her appointments virtually. Um, we've had to do that a couple times for her. Again, um, I feel like it is my job to be able to go above and beyond as much as possible. Um, for her, it was really important for her to do her lab draw and it was also really important to find a way that she felt most comfortable with because, I mean, even up there while she was doing her lab work, she was having a slight panic attack and started to hyperventilate a little bit, but she was able to calm down and get back out of the clinic. So um, I'm still in great contact with her. Um, again, she's still not going out much. And so the next time she comes in for her lab work, we will probably do the same thing, which is okay because as long as she's able to get in and do her lab work, um, for us, that's the most important part because we don't want her to lapse in care like she has for so many months. So, next slide. Um, and our last period of care, um, and this one's really hard, um, it's very common. He is a 55 year old white male. Um, he is homeless. Um, and it's this patient is really hard because he does not have a cell phone. Um, he lives under a bridge. Usually um, it's one that's really close to the clinic. So at times <clears throat> it is easy for us to find him. But um, when they come up and start cleaning up the streets and pushing the people from, from out under the bridge, that's when it becomes really hard to find. Um, he has been to the hospital several times. Um, he is, he has a CD4 count of four, or three, I'm sorry, he has a CD4 count of three. Um, that is really scary and difficult to deal with. Um, he has been to the hospital across the street several times. Um, they admit him, 
they look at him and then he's back out on the streets within two hours. Um, we finally got him. Um, he finally just wandered into the clinic. Um, I have gone out and searched for him when we um, got his lab work back from one of his previous appointments and saw his CD4. Um, me and a coworker have hit the streets trying to find him. Um, come to find out he was, since the hospital across the street uh, was not helping him, he ended up in another hospital. And then when he finally got back into the, he just wandered into the clinic and we were able to squeeze him in that day, get an appointment. Um, Dr. Connell had the heads up and we were able to, she talked to him and we got him on medication. We ordered it from the OSC pharmacy and it was delivered here. Um, once I received the medication, um, once I received the medication, once it was delivered, I was able to go out and find him. Luckily, he was really close to the clinic. Um, and then I kind of just sat on the corner with him and explained to him his medications, showed him the bottles, showed him the times that um, he needs to, like, how much he needs to take and all that. Um, I came across him a couple of days ago, asked him if he was taking his medications. Um, he says, yes, he did admit to it. He has missed a day or two. Um, and I advised him as much as possible, just try to stay on top of it. Um, I'm hoping that he would be back in the clinic next week so we can do a follow-up and see where his numbers are and everything like that. Um, and then just trying to keep that constant dialogue with him is really hard. Um, when I'm leaving work, whether it's on lunch or going home, if I see him, I do stop, go park and walk back to him and try to keep that communication with him in hopes that the more I talk to him, the more he becomes more comfortable with me, the easier it'd be for him to come to the clinic and ask for help. Um, I know he is not a fan coming here just because he has a shopping cart with him um, and he's not, sometimes it's hard for him to get into the clinic, um, but it's, I'm doing the best I can with him. We all are. Um, so hopefully he stays on top of his medication and by being in communication with him, reminding him to take it as much as I see him, that's going to help. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so this side, this one kind of says it all. Um, these are points that I brought up in my ways of breaking through barriers. Um, I'm very persistent in communication. Um, I will call you and leave voicemails. I will send you emails. Um, I try not to be too persistent with it. I try to leave it at, um, I will call and leave a voicemail and then put it on my spreadsheet and I try to call at least every two days. Um, not every patient is like this, but I do feel like there are quite a few patients that do need, <clears throat> excuse me, those every two day phone calls or emails. Um, again, I have a running list of HIV groups, support groups, rehab facilities on the standby, ready to print out or email or just give them the locations over the phone. Um, is my easiest thing to do. And then the other job too is a lot of our patients have medications delivered here. So I call them as soon as those medications get in. Um, all the medications come through me when they get to the clinic, the ones that are mailed from the OU pharmacy. So I'm lucky um, here, especially over the last few months, I have been able to communicate with a lot of our patients and establishing a really good rapport with them. And so my overall 
goal being a parent advocate is just trying to get as many of our patients back into care um, and stay in care. And so um, I'm very persistent and I won't stop until they're back in this clinic and seeing the doctors and staying on their medications. And I will do anything I can to make it happen. So I think that is all for me, Dr. Ladd. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Scotty. There is so much that 